So now I want to introduce the idea of a monadic continuation passing style. So as I saw, as we talked a bit about before, uh, this idea where we want to chain two uh, operations that are in CPS style together. And of course, whenever you do that, you're essentially talking about bind. Uh, so how does bind work? Uh, that's what I tried to explain in the past video. But now I want us to think about it more abstractly. And I want us to think about how to do more operators on um, using this API. Okay, so first thing is, um, so I showed you the division, right, where I just returned something okay, and I returned something error. Um, but I could do something a bit different, right? Assuming I already have this CPS uh, bind, um, what I did here, I can actually make this more explicit. I can say save, divide uh, 10 by 2. So I do save division and two, and here I do a lambda x save division x by two. Actually, let me do three. And instead of having um, this thing where I always pass default OK, I'm just going to define CPS run. Do I have CPS run somewhere? I have run CPS here. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So I actually had, um, I created a function or a struct for return OK and one for return error. And then uh, just so it shows a bit nicer. Then I have this run CPS that simply provides the defaults. OK, so if instead of doing that, I just do run CPS. And this parenthesis. So as you can see here, it created the struct return OK uh, with five thirds. So if I do zero here, division by zero. OK, which is what we want. And so what are we running? We did the bind. And this would be the continuation. OK, so this is one example. Uh, so now let's assume I want to do as follows. I want something, I want to write. So here, this is basically what we're doing is we're defining x to be the result of 10 divided by 2. Okay. But we could very easily, let's say we always want to return something. We always want to, how would we think, like imagine this in terms of how would you return a value, right? So if I wanted to return a value, let's say number 10 using CPS style, how would I do it? Well, I would do it, call, let's call this return. Okay, so return x. So x takes an OK and an error, right? And if I want to return x, I simply call OK and I pass x to it. Right? Does that make sense? So if I want to return x, let me do a second example. Instead of doing run CPS of this, let's say I want to bind this and I want to return Actually, instead of bind, I just want to return simplest example, return 10. Let's see what happens. See, it just returns 10. So it, it calls the function return OK and passes 10 to it. Okay, so it's the simplest thing you could do. So if we did this, we could also do uh, the error one. We can call it define raise an error x. So how do we raise an error? Pretty simple, right? We just do error x. 
me comment this out, comment this out. So now instead of returning 10, if I want to raise 10, it, it returned an error 10, right? Usually when it's a, an error, you want to say what's going on. So uh, error invalid input. Okay, it's any, any string I want. In this case, I just wanted to say I got an invalid input. Okay, in the previous example, I want to say I want to return number 10. Okay, but of course here it could be anything. Okay. So I showed you how to encode the idea of uh, returning 10 using CPS and just raising an exception is perceived as returning something to the error uh, continuation, right? So I can create this primitive that also takes the okay and error and simplifies this. Why would I want to do that? Well, very simple. One thing I can do is Okay, so let's say if, so you define, you're, you're doing some number, let's say you don't even know what this is. Well, now I could write this code. If x uh, is even, if x is even, then return x divided by two. Otherwise, raise an exception, not even. Okay, let me see if the parentheses are okay. Right, so what I did here is I, I have a division, and if that division succeeds, and the value is um, not zero, is not even, um, then I re raise an exception, but if it is even, I return, I divide that by two. So in this case, it's not even. Why? Because 10 divided by two is five. But if it were, like in the case of eight, or no, eight, then it returns okay. So it abstracts away. So here we are abstracting away the notion of control flow, right? So we have bind, we have return, and we have race. So what? How would we go about and implement try catch? Try catch is very simple. Is very interesting the way it works. So let's look at how bind works first, so that we can understand how try works. So the way bind works is you have O1, right? And O1 is given two possibilities, right? Either O1 succeeds or O1 goes to an error. And as you, we mentioned before. We always have this uh, error and return as parameters to return our values. So what we're saying is when O1 ends, which is this code right here, the way I understand it and I visualize it is, if I want O1 to return some value and that value succeeds, I send it to O2, right? Which is why you have uh, this continuation here because the, continu the first parameter is what do you do with the return of O1? So in this case, I'm saying I'm, I'm passing it to a, a lambda that's going to pass it to um, O2. Here it is. Otherwise, what do I do? If I have an error, if O1 returns an error, I send it, I plug that error on error. So the parameter error here. But if the thing works, uh, and O2 succeeds, then I connect that directly to return because that's ultimately what I want to return. I want to return the result of O2. But if O2 fails, I also want it to send that result to error. So the diagram becomes like this. O1 forwards O case to O2, which forwards OK to return. And O1 and O2 forward errors to error the input error, right? So I'm always talking about these two parameters. So how does try catch work? Let's see it in terms of a visualization. You run O1, right? And if O1 works, uh, you return that value. So there was no exception here. That's how you have to think. So what you're going to do is the, the insight that I want to give you is that try works exactly like bind, but with the channels flipped, the okay and error fl channels flipped. So let's think about it. 
for a, for a bit. If O1 is running, and you want to see if O1 can run, right? So I'm going to run O1, and if there's an exception, I want to handle it in O2. So this O2 is going to be your exception handler, right? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to run O1. If O1 succeeds, I don't run my exception handler, right? I don't, I don't run the accept or, or catch part. So if O1 succeeds, I send the result directly to OK, ignoring O2. But if O1 fails, right, well, O2 is the exception handler. So if O2 is the exception handler, it has to receive the exception as a parameter, which is why you pass the lambda. So what does O2 does do with it? Well, O2 will then handle that exception, which is receiving it. And then if that uh, code succeeds, then the whole thing succeeds. You send that to the result. Okay. But if O2 also throws an exception, then you send that to the real exception handler. And as you can see from these diagrams and these diagrams and the code, one is the mirror of the other, where you simply flip the OK with the error channel. And I find that very nice, right? Because as I was saying before, if OK, uh, like if you think about an exception as just a return, which it is, right? Essentially just returning through a different channel, if you will. So you have any function can return two kinds of uh, values, either the result, the return value, or the exception is throwing. And if that's the case, then sequencing becomes bind, where you have to be careful because at any point you can get an exception and you have to abort computation, right? So if you run O1 and you want to run O1 followed by O2, if O1 fails, you have to throw that exception above. And if O2 fails, it does have to do that as well. But if O1 succeeds, you, you pass the value directly to O2 O2 succeeds, you sequencing the result of both expressions is the result of the second one. Similarly with try-catch is the opposite or the reverse, right? You want to run O1 and you only want to run O2 if O1 fails, right? O2 is the exception handler. So if O1 succeeds, it has the same behavioral behavior as uh, when O1 is sequenced and fails. Right? Because this succeeds, it's not going to run O2. If O1 fails, then it runs O2. And then if O2 fails, then the whole thing fails. Right? So for the only way for you to see an error is because the exception handler failed. Otherwise, either O1 succeeded or O2 succeeded. Okay. And this is, uh, I think, something really cool that monads make very clear. Uh, at least conceptually clear. <laughs> um, so what we can do is in this slide, I'm just showing you safe division uh, using return and fail uh, and raise, sorry. So it more high level. So if X is divided by zero, raise an exception, otherwise return the value. Uh, and now you can uh, have this code that is a bit nicer. You divide one by two and you try that exception. So if there's an exception, then you return 10. And what you will see is that this whole thing returns 10. And then if you extend the notation, the do notation, you can make it even cleaner. Which is to say it, you assign x3 divided by four, and then you try and you have an exception here, and then you can wrap this all around. Okay. So in the next video, I'm going to cover how do you call and catch exceptions in Racket.